Hello, everyone. So I'm Nick Granger from the Oil and Gas Authority. So I'm going to talk to you about digital excellence and our program to use data as a catalyst for creating economic value. So very briefly, a short overview of what we do as an organization. We were created about four or five years ago as a result of a review that was done into the North Sea oil and gas. And we, we have a role to regulate, influence and promote the UK oil and gas industry and also to fully support the energy transition. And we see data as being a critical element of that as we try to work as a data centric business and also to work with the industry to move towards using data to make our decisions. So I'm now going to start off by showing you a video in terms of what we're doing for digital excellence. With up to 20 billion barrels of remaining potential, our shared goal with industry is to maximize economic recovery of hydrocarbon resources on the UK continental shelf. From exploration and asset stewardship to decommissioning and supply chain, the Oil and Gas Authority is working across the sector to drive a new level of performance across the industry. Putting data at the heart of the energy sector as we transition to a low carbon economy means harnessing the expertise of our people to drive lateral thinking, unlocking opportunities with data and digitalization, and creating powerful data sets to create new insights. This is the uh, culmination of three years of, of fantastically hard but exciting work. Since the Oil and Gas Authority was formed, we have introduced a new data-centric asset stewardship process, significantly improved production reporting and exploration data, and created a new range of mapping and geospatial tools. This focus on data is driving collaboration and performance, from boosting geochemical analysis reporting to launching of a seismic data program promoting exploration activity to impressive usage and download figures for the OGA Open Data Site and Packages. The launch of the UK National Data Repository, NDR, was the first milestone on our road to digital excellence, with decades of industry-reported data becoming accessible to all. So we've, we've been working on this since the organisation was created, and one of the first things we did after the review that created the organisation was to say that we didn't, as an organization, have the right powers in place to collect the data from industry. So we've worked on that for a couple of years and have those powers now that there is a responsibility on the companies that are operating in the North Sea to submit data to us. And then we, after a certain confidentiality period, have the right to disclose that data openly. So that data can then be used for academics, for the supply chain, for inward investment to look at the different options to add value into the UKCS. We've got a couple of products in place. The National Data Repository was launched about six months ago. Um, started with 173 terabytes of data, has been downloaded from that site since then. Um, this site is openly available to anyone, so anyone can log on to the National Data Repository and see huge amounts of data that they can then use. And what we're hoping is that this will encourage businesses to take that data, use machine learning, use that wider data that you perhaps wouldn't have as one company to be able to understand the UKCS in a different way. We also have the Open Data Portal, which has been around for uh, about 18 months longer. This holds data that we as the organization have either generated or purchased directly ourselves. So this is completely open data that anybody can, again, access and use to look at the different areas within the UKCS and also wider in terms of oil and gas. Um, and as you can see on this, it runs off a GIS system and it can be used to access these different data types. Across our digital platform then, we've got a huge number of users. Um, 183 terabytes of data has been downloaded from that platform. 184 countries, I think it's gone up to 191 countries now that are accessing that data. And that's an intention for creating it 
was to encourage inward investment into the basin as well. And as the video has sort of uh, stuttered a little bit, I've come to this point a little bit earlier, so I'm within the eight minutes, so I will hand over the question. Thank you very much, Nick. <laughs> and apologies for the sound issues there. Um, I think we've already got lots of people wanting to ask questions. We've got one over there. Uh, do I see another hand going up somewhere? Great. Uh, Dave, real name. Um, you talked a lot about, well, you, you mentioned a few times around um, transition to a low carbon economy, but this sounds like a lot of ways to both extract oil, um, use Palantir, uh, who have quite a problematic history, and it, like a lot of data resources that where we might be spending carbon again <laughs> managing the data. Can you tell me a little bit about how this actually addresses the systemic problem of climate change in this country rather than makes it easier to extract more oil? Thank you, Dave. Um, anyone else want to ask a question the first round? Uh, and there is one. Hi, could you um, say a little bit more about the new data powers that you mentioned and how do they work and what, what's the period of time that you need to wait before you can then release that data? Thank you. Okay, so um, in terms of your question, Dave, around sort of the energy transition, so our primary remit is to maximize economic recovery in oil and gas. Um, but as we're moving to a, a low carbon economy with the net zero agenda for 2050, we are currently working with a number of different government organizations, um, arms length bodies, to look at the options for energy integration. So you will have seen on our corporate plan the link with wind farms. Um, there are a lot of the infrastructure that's already in place in the UK CS that could be used for new technologies such as carbon capture and storage. Um, in terms of the new data powers, so those are around uh, three different areas. Firstly, in terms of reporting, so the requirement for certain individuals and operators to report data to us. There's then a requirement around retention, so how long the companies themselves have to retain the data in what formats. Um, but I think the one that has the most impact um, or potential impact going forward is around the disclosure ability. So different types of data have different disclosure periods. So some of those will be longer. So some data, seismic data, for example, will give a longer period so that the organization that has generated that can create a commercial return from it. But some pieces of data are released um, almost straight away on um, reporting to us. It, it really depends on the, the different data types, and we have a, a breakdown of all of those. Uh, next round of questions, and again, I'm very conscious um, we've got quite a gender imbalance in the questions so far. Um, any questions? I've got one down here. Any more? I'm Steve Parks from Convivio. Um, you've had some success in getting data opened up through use of your statutory powers. Have you had any success through simple negotiation? Have you been able to get people to provide you with more data? And what have you learned and what tools have you used? Has it been uh, memorandums of understanding? Uh, has it been data sharing agreements? What have you found works to get that data together? Um, two questions, actually, if I may. Um, the first one is, what systems do you have for deciding when particular data series is no longer required? Because there is a tendency in databases to simply aggregate more and more information. And I know it's quite difficult when you're talking about um, machine learning and data mining. You don't really know in advance what uh, is going to turn out. But at a certain stage, you've got to draw the line somewhere and say, this is not being used, this is not worth having. Um, and the second question really is, how are you having problems with um, data definitions? Okay, so in terms of the data collection, we do a lot of it through those uh, statutory powers. We 
have worked with industry to try and work on a collaborative basis. So one of the things that the National Data Repository does is it gives organizations that are working together the ability to share data amongst them prior to public release so that they can use that data to collaborate and hold it in one place rather than in multiple places. Um, we haven't gone down the MOU route as such, primarily because the, the data powers that we've got in place are quite extensive and actually having those powers, we haven't necessarily had to use any of the, the sanction abilities in there because just having the powers has encouraged people to provide the data to us. That said, we haven't seen a massive um, issue in terms of, of data sharing with the industry. Um, data series not required. It's always an interesting one, isn't it? But we, in the data powers we've got, we have set out some sort of clear areas, but we've also then put a lot of the requirements into guidance. And the reason for that is to give us the flexibility that if in the future we see that a certain type of data isn't needed anymore, then we won't continue to collect it purely because we've always done it that way. Um, so we're just trying try to keep up to date in terms of, in terms of that. Um, data definitions, has anyone been able to come up with a, a nice, easy way to do data definitions? Um, I wouldn't say that we've got an easy solution to that one but we do work quite closely with industry um, and make sure that we're as consistent as possible in terms of the definitions that are used. And I think we can squeeze in one more set of questions. We've got one down here and we've got one towards the back as well. Thank you. Let's start there. Um, just about your decision to create your own platforms to share data publicly as opposed to maybe using sort of centralized platforms or anything about that and why that decision was made or if that's historic or anything. Thank you. And then over to Mark. I, I wonder do you, do you have um, any sort of use cases of people have downloaded this data and then run machine learning or whatever on it um, that you're particularly excited about? So in terms of using our own platforms, so the open data site we run, but we do use um, software basis that's run off Esri. Um, we, with the National Data Repository, are actually working in collaboration with a platform that was already in place with industry. Um, the reason that that wasn't working um, to the full extent was it was only available to people that were members of that subscription basis, so it wasn't available to the public. So we've actually taken the product that was there and built on that to use it for a, a wider basis. So I think the reason for going down the, our platform route was that the systems were already in place that we could build on, so it's, it's sort of a bit of both. Um, in terms of the use cases we do, um, a large number of them that I've heard about though are commercially sensitive, so unfortunately I can't share them. But I can, can tell you that there are a, a number of particularly small businesses working in the North Sea that are taking that data and using it to start start working with machine learning. But sorry, I can't give you a, a better answer on that one. Okay, Nick, thank you very much indeed.